Would you pray with me? Father, as we have sung of the blood of your Son shed upon the cross, and as we now turn our attention to your word and look further into the death of our Savior, I pray that our hearts would be properly affected. Lord, that as we ponder and contemplate what it really means for a God-man to hang on a cross and bear the weight of wrath for all who would believe, Lord, I pray that we would be sobered, that our hearts would be quieted, that we would be overwhelmed with gratefulness. Lord, help us to see what we must about you. Help us to see what we must about your great gospel. And we ask in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Please be seated. I invite you to open your Bible and turn to John chapter 19. If you don't have a Bible, we have some men who are going to be making their way down the aisles. And if you just raise your hand, we'd love to get one for you. And again, you can open up that Bible to John chapter 17. Referring to the horrific cross upon which Jesus died, John Piper in his book, Seeing and Savoring Jesus Christ, states this. The agonies of the Son of God were incomparable. No one ever suffered like this man. No one ever deserved suffering less, yet received so much. The only person in history who did not deserve to suffer, suffered most. No one has ever borne so much injustice with so little vengeance. Not because the torment was tolerable, if we had been forced to watch, we probably would have passed out, end quote. When we come to the account of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, we're forced to watch. From a distance, but our minds and our hearts and our bodies and our souls are engaged The death of Jesus was horrific, but we must watch and we must see and we must understand because it is upon this event that the gospel stands. It is upon this, the most tragic event of all of human history, that the most glorious reality springs forth. The greatest injustice ever committed is the launching pad for that which God receives eternal, infinite praise and glory for. That is the selfless sacrifice of the Son of God on behalf of all who would believe. Read with me John 19, verses 17 through 30. Starting in verse 17, John 19 says, They took Jesus, therefore, and he went out. Bearing his own cross to the place called the place of a skull, which is called in Hebrew Golgotha. There they crucified him. And with him two other men, one on either side and Jesus in between. Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It was written, Jesus the Nazarene, the king of the Jews. Therefore, many of the Jews read this inscription for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city and it was written in Hebrew, Latin, and in Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews were saying to Pilate, do not write the king of the Jews, but that he said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his outer garments and made four parts, a part to every soldier and also the tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to decide whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture. They divided my outer garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Therefore, the soldiers did these things. But standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus then saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, behold your mother. From that hour, the disciple took her into his own household. 
After this, Jesus, knowing that all things had already been accomplished to fulfill the scripture, said, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there, so they put a sponge full of the sour wine upon a branch of hyssop and brought it up to his mouth. Therefore, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. The horrible road of Jesus' death unfolds in our passage here in five scenes. The horrible road of Jesus' death unfolds in five scenes. Jesus' death was a horrible, tragic event, the worst of all humanity. And this evening, we will see it unfold in five scenes. And we need to remember what has taken place up to this point in verse 17, to remember the emotional, the physical, the spiritual torment he already faced. Jesus agonized in the garden, was insulted by numerous hypocrites, his beard ripped out, they covered his face with their spit, they scourged him, being lacerated by whips to the point that his body was mangled and unrecognizable. Thorns pressed into his skull, stripped to the point of indignity, Jesus had endured so much pain, so much as he is walking to his death, and now we come to the worst of it. And verse 17 gives way to the cross as the first scene of the horrible road of Jesus' death. And here, number one, we see Jesus' horrific crucifixion is summarized. Jesus' horrific crucifixion is summarized. Look again at verse 17. They took Jesus, therefore, and he went out bearing his own cross to the place called the place of a skull, which is called in Hebrew Golgotha. And there they crucified him. And with him, two other men, one on either side, and Jesus in between. Pilate delivered his sentence and then delivered Jesus over to the guards and the soldiers who would carry out this deed. These soldiers are mocking him, beating him. They make Jesus carry his own cross, which was customary to bring upon the criminal shame. And this was standard procedure the sight of the beaten, bloodied prisoner was meant to strike fear in the people. And in contemplating this, to think if the soldiers, if they had known who it was they were doing this to, if the Holy Spirit, but for a moment, gave them a glimpse of the reality of that person with whom they were crucifying. If the Holy Spirit had granted to them understanding of whom, this they were do- of whom they were doing this to, they would have been utterly undone in that moment, instantly. But they did not know, and this was business as usual for these guards. They were doing what they would always do, crim- uh, crucifying a criminal, another outlaw. And in this moment, judgment wasn't coming on them, but rather judgment was falling on the Savior who took every sting and every blow. He took every punch, yet he knew every one of their names, their lives, everything that would condemn them in eternity and more than that. He didn't just know it, but he silently and willingly walked to his own death, carrying his own cross, all the while wanting and longing for the salvation of sinners, even some who committed the atrocities. In fact, in Luke 23, 34, after all that had been done to Jesus, his first words he speaks during his crucifixion, after the nails had gone in, after being set up, after the humiliation, the first thing he says is, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. See, the treasure of the gospel shines forth in this statement as the Savior prays this prayer after all of the agony, after the nails having gone in and the the jarring of the cross as it is stood up. After the struggle and labor of each breath, the first thing Jesus says is a prayer to the Father asking for forgiveness for the very ones who hung him there. Have you ever wondered if God could possibly forgive you for the atrocities, for the sin that you have committed? Let this be a resounding yes. 
The work of Jesus and the love of Jesus is fully capable of forgiving you whatever your sins may be. That is the heart of our Savior in the gospel. John gives us some other details in his summary here of Jesus' crucifixion. The execution site was called the place of the skull outside of the city, outside of Jerusalem, and he was crucified with two other criminals just as if it had been another day. He was another common criminal. And all of these seemingly minor details are fulfilling the Father's plan perfectly, many of which were prophesied of. Crucifixion was regarded as the worst, most shameful, horrible form of execution and was so bad that Roman citizens were not to be crucified. It was reserved for the worst of the worst and there Jesus is hanging with two other criminals yet as the three of them hung there suffering, the suffering of the two criminals in that moment was nothing compared to the infinitely greater suffering of Jesus as he was bearing the weight, the wrath, the sin, and being separated from the Father. The horrible road of Jesus' death unfolds first with Jesus' horrific crucifixion being summarized. And now the second scene of Jesus' horrible death unfolds as Jesus' true kingship is ascribed. We start to see some details unfold here as Jesus' true kingship is ascribed. Jesus' true kingship is put on display and it's done so through the sinfulness of man. It was customary to place a placard, the, the crime for which the one was being condemned. In Jesus' case, no crime was committed. Thus, Pilate decided, seeing as he was pressured into this by the Jews to have Jesus crucified, to take a shot at them, and he had an inscription put on the cross, Jesus the Nazarene, the King of the Jews. You see that in verse 19. And just to be sure, everyone could read it. He had it written in Hebrew, Latin, and in Greek, as there would be passers-by who spoke all of those languages. And the chief priests of the Jews went to Pilate, obviously upset and disturbed. We see that in verse 21. They say to him, do not write the king of the Jews, but that he said, I am the king of the Jews. They wanted him to change the wording so that Christ would appear to be an imposter. But Pilate simply refuses, most likely out of spite for the Jews, and God uses sinful men in a sinful spat to accomplish his sovereign purposes. Neither Pilate nor the Jewish leaders believed Jesus was the king of the Jews. Yet he was, and not only that, Jesus is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And in that moment, Jesus turns an instrument of torture to a throne of glory and reigns from a tree. God desired that history give testimony that the Messiah was rejected by his people. Jesus was innocent. All he did was go around healing people, preaching kindness and forgiveness and grace. And how corrupt is the human heart that people would kill their own savior? How evil people are to deceive themselves into th thinking that they can make it to God on their own when the Old Testament promised that he was the one. And how sinister people are in their heart to be so hypocritical to think they are righteous while they kill a truly innocent man who takes it silently like a lamb to the slaughter. And through sinful vengeance, Jesus' true kingship is ascribed As we continue on, the next scene that unfolds on this horrible road to Jesus' death is Jesus' timeless sovereignty is demonstrated. Number three, Jesus' timeless sovereignty is demonstrated, and that's in verses 23 through the first part of 25. When Jesus should be at his weakest, all of his purposes are still coming to pass. Here is prophetic fulfillment during Jesus' crucifixion from Psalm 22. The execution squad normally included four soldiers under, under the command of a centurion, and the clothes would be divided among the four soldiers, but so as not to make the tunic worthless, they see it better as they are acting purely on selfish motives to cast lots in order to decide who would get it. 
And Jesus' timeless sovereignty is demonstrated. There is no moment ever where Jesus is not reigning, where Jesus is not orchestrating all things for his glory. Even here, God is directing and ordaining and bringing about all of his purposes in this moment. God upholds his word. And when from a worldly perspective, it seems that all power and all authority and purpose of Jesus has been thwarted, In this moment, when all seems lost by sinful men, John shows us Jesus was no less in control as he hung on that cross. Jesus is infinitely transcendent. And listen, if Jesus was no less in control when he hung on that cross, being crucified and mocked and ridiculed, but was bringing about his perfect will, how much confidence can we have? How much confidence must we have in life's hardships when it feels for us as well that life is hopeless, that hope is lost, that purpose has been drowned, that all is undone? How much confidence can we have as we gaze at our Savior's amazing sovereignty in his darkest hour and we see his complete control In our darkest times, we can have confidence that he is near, that he is good, that he is no less in control, that he has a plan, that he has a purpose. And this leads right into our next scene. In verse 25, we see Jesus' intimate love is expressed. Jesus' intimate love is expressed. Not only is Jesus supremely sovereign in every detail of his crucifixion, but his love is not deterred. His compassion is not hindered or set aside. In the moment of all of Jesus' transcendence, all of his compassion is not hindered or set aside. When he is full of transcendence and his sovereignty is put on full display, In the midst of all of the agony he is experiencing, you have this beautiful moment as Jesus' intimate love is expressed. Look at verse 25. But standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother, and then jump down to verse 26, when Jesus then saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, behold your mother. In all of the agony, in all of the pain, in all of the vile sin, in all of the atrocity, there is this tender moment as he cares for his mother. Mother, behold your son. And if ever there was a time for Jesus' attention to be fixed on himself, it was this. Yet he can't do it as he cares for his mother in this moment. He's not wanting everyone to get into his shoes of all of his suffering. He is rather filled with compassion and intimate love, knowing the heartache of a loving mother watching her son be ripped apart and crucified before her eyes. Every mother in the room can imagine what this must have been like and even then can't fathom something fully like this until you are in it. Her son is broken, and her heart is devastated. Jesus knows that in losing a son, she is gaining a savior, yet he is still tender in his care for her and understands and knows her heartbreak and fears and concerns, and he tends to her in that moment. And shocking tenderness and relational love and burden for a broken heart is all displayed. He says to this disciple that he loved, that is John, behold, John, your mother, take care of her. And Jesus, in his darkest hour, puts his mother's needs above his own. Here we see Jesus isn't only aware of the needs of his people, he is deeply and richly providing for them. Do you believe Jesus will do this for you? Jesus hasn't forgotten our needs. He sees them from heaven like he saw them from the cross and he will draw near to your life in intimate love and care. Lastly, 
the last scene on this horrific road to Jesus' death that we see is Jesus' unrelenting commitment is displayed. Jesus' unrelenting commitment is displayed. This is an unrelenting commitment to the Father's will. Nothing, not the smallest detail will be overlooked by Jesus. He has an unrelenting commitment to the Father's will. Even to the point of death. Jesus at the center of his heart in the crucifixion was the will of God. He loved it above all else so much so that nothing would rob him of the pleasure of walking in it, even if it took his life, even though it meant separation from the Father. And in Jesus' final moments, he was thinking about all that had to take place to fulfill the Father's will. One last prophecy, knowing that all things had already been accomplished to fulfill the scriptures, he says, I am thirsty in verse 28. He refused this pain doling drink earlier and now he is ready to drink not for the easement of pain but for the fulfillment of his father's will and he drinks it. And after doing so, on the cross he cried out not a cry of defeat but one of victory the most tragically wonderful words spoken it is finished. Nothing else needed to be added to what Jesus did on that cross, not by Jesus on the cross and not by you or me today. After everything, Jesus is still in full control of his own life, finally allows himself to die, bowing his head, giving up his spirit, knowing that what the Father had desired for him to do and to accomplish had been completed. Now listen, you can't partially accept this work of Jesus. There is a line drawn in the sand at the cross and you either are on one side or the other. Either you reject Jesus or you accept Jesus. There is no blurring of the line when you get to the cross. How would you do that? How would you partially submit your life to a God-man who did this? A partial submission is no submission at all. Either you have both feet in or both feet are out, which describes you this evening. As you ponder and view our Savior's death, where are you at before him? For those who repent of their sin and turn to Jesus in faith, trusting in his work alone for forgiveness of sins, there is hope and joy and life and peace with God. And for all others, condemnation. Each of us needs to ponder this reality tonight. And the men in just a moment are going to come and they are going to pass out a piece of bread and a cup of juice. And these are symbols to represent what we just looked at. Jesus' body on the cross being crushed and his blood being spilt out. There's nothing extra spiritual about the bread and the, and the juice that we're taking tonight. But it is, they are symbols to remind us of what Jesus did. And oh, how we need to be reminded of our precious Savior's death because it was a death that we deserved. Now, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, if you have entrusted your life to him, we want you to take with us tonight. If you're visiting or a member here, it doesn't matter. We'd love for you to take the bread and the cup. But if you're not a believer in Jesus Christ, we would simply ask you to let the the trays pass by as this is a time, a precious time for believers to remember their savior, but I would ask you to consider Christ. I'd ask you even now to repent and turn to this savior. Submit your life to him in faith and repentance and then take. But if not, let them pass by. Men, please come and serve us. This evening, we're gonna take the bread and the cup together. And so as they distribute them to you, you can just hold them and I will come up in just a moment and we will take them together.
wonderful reality that we find forgiveness of sins in the substitute of Jesus Christ on our behalf. On the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took bread with his disciples and he broke it and he said, this is my body, eat this in remembrance of me. Let's eat together and remember our Savior's body that was broken on our behalf. And in the same way, he took a cup of wine and said, this is my blood poured out for you. And again, the wine symbolizes the precious blood that merely hours later would be shed so that we might have forgiveness of sins. Let's drink together and remember our Savior's blood. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your son. Thank you for his great sacrifice. Thank you that we can know you and be reconciled to you. I pray that we would be overwhelmed with the sacrifice of our Lord and that we would in turn give to him every bit of praise we have. We ask in Christ's name, amen. 